I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, so Neckpen is the co-founder and CEO of At Women Work. Now, um, Neckpen is a certified career coach with a decade of experience in business development strategy, mentorship, and nonprofit board service. Um, as a UN Global Ambassador for Sustainable Development Goal 5, Neckpen leverages her passion for women's empowerment and to advise leaders on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, welcome, Neckpen. I'm so excited to get to speak with you. Um, all right. So we want to talk a little bit about the intersection between diversity and wellness. So can you kind of um, break down what workplace wellness means as that term and what it encompasses? Because I feel like it means something different to a lot of people. Totally. I would have to agree with you. It does mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. And I think um, when we think about wellness, um, centering on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion is really a healthy space to start because the point of diversity, equity, and inclusion is to think about how we can be our full selves at work, right? Um, whatever identities we share or don't share, um, it's important that we create a wellness opportunity for people to really be themselves fully. And so I think about diversity, equity, and inclusion as the core to wellness at work, because it's the pathway where we allow folks to be who they truly are. And I think about being well in the sense that I can express myself fully in all my identities as a woman, as a black woman, as a mother, as um, you know, a colleague that wants and needs flex time to be well, as someone who's working through things in a global pandemic. When we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, we need to understand that that's the core to wellness for most employees. Being able to show up is what you can and need to be and having the flexibility to really be your true self at work. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and you're right. It does mean so much, um, you know, to so many different people. Um, so yeah, workplace wellness is going to look completely different for me than it might for you or even, you know, one of my power to fly colleagues. We're still, we're kind of all in that same fishbowl, but our needs are going to be different. Totally. Now, I know that you have spoken in the past about those stressors that are associated with in-person work, especially for mothers um, and particularly for black women. Can you tell us a little bit more about those stressors and how they affect these groups specifically? Yes, I think um, one of the things that I will have to say that I've loved as a silver lining uh, and working remotely has been the opportunity to dig deeper and to reflect on my own experiences in the workplace. And from there, I've been able to put out a lot of articles and just guidance um, that really touch on some of the lived experiences that uh, minority professionals, women, black women in particular as well, um, have had to deal with in the workplace that we weren't always comfortable talking about. And it was only because we were removed from those places that we can now sit and say, wow, this has been uh, stressful being in person. I really love being remote. I really love not having to see my colleagues every day. And I don't know that everyone necessarily enjoys working remotely. I certainly love the good you know, in-person meeting to get things done. Uh, I love seeing my colleagues from time to time, but I think a lot of women I've spoken to through my work as a coach um, and also my work through women work have told me that they really don't want to go back in person. And a research recently revealed that most black women over 80% said that they would prefer to be remote instead of working in person. Well, why is that? I mean, what is going on at work that feels so different for us compared to maybe our other colleagues? I think one thing that a lot of people have expressed concerns about, you know, um, particularly mothers and black women in terms of their ethnic and racial identity is this idea that the workplace asks us to pretend to be things we are not. Uh, I saw a really good quote and I heard it from um, someone I follow closely, Reshma Shujani, who's an amazing advocate for moms. She recently shared how a lot of women are asked to work um, as employees as if they're not mothers which is a ridiculous thing, right? Because as anyone who's a mom knows, motherhood requires the best of us. It demands the best of us. And it is something that is always top of mind. You can't undo it once you become a mom. And so when workplaces demand moms work very strict hours, right? Rigid um, time on the clock that's not centered on anything around family or children, <laughs> It's really a missed opportunity, I feel, um, to not have more wellness in the workplace. For Black women, some of the challenges are more so around microaggressions and having to sort of explain ourselves as other for some people, um, whether it's around hair, culture, references that are cultural to us. Um, I know that for me, I'll be honest, I think a lot of my 
own work as a coach in the last year has expanded because I've sat with people who just don't know a lot about black people. I mean, they just don't have a lot of black friends or family members at all that are black. And so not knowing someone's personal lived experience and having that translate to work can create a lot of extra work, I will say, for black women in the workplace. And so the wellness concern there is that we're not only performing in our roles like everyone else, we're also having to sort of educate and inform the culture at work about who we are and how we're just, you know, for the most part, like everyone else, just different lived experiences. And so I think, um, you know, this question gets to the heart of what does it mean to create a workplace that's really inclusive, that does not create extra work for other people. And also, I think works to educate everyone about what it means to be a good colleague and a good coworker. Um, I don't think a lot of the microaggressions people uh, express are intentional. I actually don't. I think a lot of people are just coming from a place of, for lack of a better phrase, ignorance, just not knowing, you know, what might be offensive to other people. Um, unfortunately for Black women, we've had to learn that very well so that we can be successful <laughs> of other people and not enough of that is coming our way. And so I think we have an opportunity here to think through designing a different workplace that's more inclusive and allows women to feel well at work. Yeah, sure. sure. I mean, the, as I'm listening to you, all I can, uh, I keep being um, kind of reminded of something I heard uh, probably really early in my hosting career with Power Fly in that, you know, the working world is not designed for a lot of people. It is, it was designed and put together with the idea of in general, straight, white, cisgender people, generally male or male identifying people. And so a lot of us don't fit into that box. Mm -hmm. A lot of us. Mm -hmm. And that means, you know, when you're thinking about going into work every day, if you think of it in kind of those physical ideas, right, of trying to fit into that box, you are trying to cram like five pounds a person in a one pound bag. You know, it is not built for us. And it's not, you know, because there are so many people it's not built for, we're not just wanting to change it for ourselves. We're wanting to change it for all of those people that don't fit in those boxes. Have you ever heard of fork theory before? This is something I was, I was, uh, no, please share. I haven't. So it goes kind of hand in hand with spoon theory. If you've never heard it, just Google it. There's a bunch of articles and stuff that'll tell you, but it's this idea that you have these kind of irritations or these, these battles or the, you know, things that kind of bug you throughout the day and maybe take you out of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And you might be being jabbed. They think about it like being jabbed with a fork. And sometimes it's like, it's like a Barbie sized fork and it, it's annoying, but it's there. And sometimes it is a trident right through the heart and it is awful, but that doesn't mean that a little Barbie fork poke can't be the thing that tips you over the edge. So it's not only the, you know, kind of the amalgamation and the the sum of all of these pokes, but it's also, where are you in this level before the pokes even start? Yeah. And it just reminds me so heavily of, you know, the fact that you're right. There are all these stressors for mothers. There are all these stressors for black women. And when you combine that, you are looking at an intersectional person who is not being helped at all by these situations. Yeah. And I think one of the things that you just told me that like, I, it it comes to mind, have you heard of the phrase death by a thousand cuts where it's like little things actually do add up to a really solid wound. And I think, um, one of the things I really enjoy is helping organizations. And I know Power to Fly is centered on this too, helping organizations think through what more inclusive workplaces could look like is just such a really important conversation, right? I yeah. think we assume we know what professionals should be. We assume what being inclusive should be. Let's check in, right? I design a lot of, um, you know, frameworks and analysis that help people check in intentionally to make sure that you are meeting the mark for your employees. And that mark will shift, right? I think generationally yeah. as well, right? That mark will shift as leaders sort of retire out of their roles currently with the boomers and you know, younger leaders rise up, that mark of what being more inclusive will shift. And I love our millennial colleagues who are always challenging managers like me to think through what it means to be a better manager for this new generation. It is not like before. And um, you know, we just have to keep being flexible, I think is the word. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's great. And you're right, kind of that having that reflection, that, that continuous evaluation, right? I feel like some people, um, you know, especially when you get into management, those things, it feels like a challenge, right? It feels adversarial, Mm -hmm. but it's Mm -hmm. not just look at what you're doing. You know, like is your dress code written for everyone or is it more in line with what it means to be a professional in terms of masculine professionals within the workforce? You know, do you have all, you know, let just take a look at what you're doing. 
this is the rule as it stands. Okay. Is there anybody that doesn't fit in that box? Let's talk about it. You know, and it doesn't have to be people that are in front of you. Think about it in terms of your culture gaps. Where are you trying to fill and what are you doing or not doing to make it, make it attractive and safe for, for those culture, those people that would fit your culture gaps to join you. Yep. Totally. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the the kind of diverse needs of, in a team when you're talking about everyone's well-being. What kinds of things should we be taking into consideration? This is a great question. And I love it because inherently thinking that people might need different things at the premise is a great place to start. <laughs> um, if you're a manager or if you, you know, shape the culture, a big C or little C at your company, Um, It's important to recognize that not everyone needs the same things or wants the same things. And so when we come out with policies, um, you know, that fit your business, right, that really put the corporate needs first above people, you kind of miss the opportunity to shape a better uh, workforce. And we all know that better workforces retain more talent. They have more productive teams. They have better outcomes. These are some of the motivations for why you might want to ask this question and visit it often. For me, I think the first um, one that's top of mind is just time online. I know that so many companies reward people for being uh, early actors, right? Being very visible, being very vocal. And I think some of the opportunity there is to have flexibility around time and presence in a way that really gives space for more introverted personalities, people who are not always going to speak up and need you to ask good questions to check in for moms and other kind of caretakers, not just moms who really want um, to be great employees are ready to deliver on the work and the outcomes, but they need time flexibility for their families and their lives, right? Um, I have a lot of friends who are also needing flexibility for medical issues, right? They are otherwise very intelligent, ready to add value to their team, but because they can't be online for certain hours for medical issues, um, the process of getting medical exemption has been really challenging. And so lowering the barrier there is also really important. Again, around visibility, time online, um, ask for people's comfort with delivering for you versus assuming that it will be a nine to five and assuming it will look a certain way. Another way that I think we can start to ask questions about creating more inclusive workplace and wellness at work is asking people to give you feedback regularly. I say this because I don't know that there's a lot of managers who check in enough. Um, I myself has been, have been, you know, in past workplace situations where my manager would always punt our one-on-ones and not give time for me to give feedback or check in with me. It was just not a priority. As long as I was doing well, you know, um, she would say like, you're good. We don't need this (laughs) one-on-one. Everything is fine. And I was actually waiting for opportunities to give some lens to how I was feeling about the role. I knew I was producing, but it was at the cost of something else that I wasn't sort of comfortable with. And I was waiting to have that conversation. I've over time learned that I have to manage up and kind of speak up and say, actually, I really would need to keep this time with you instead of just saying okay to everything. But I don't know that everyone creates intentional time for um, their teams to check in with them one-on-one and really share that feedback. So that's another structural thing you can do differently. I think one other place that I think we have opportunities to really robustly support our ERGs, our employee resource groups, Um, ERG serve as a really healthy space for employees to gather and share their collective concerns, um, to discuss things that they want to see change with power of the many and not the few. Um, A lot of folks at work feel very uncomfortable speaking up about issues that they don't agree with because they are afraid of being retaliated against. They're afraid of the culture um, sort of coming for them. And so ERGs are a great space for folks to really collectively discuss and come up with recommendations to improve their workplace and the wellness options there. And so robustly funding your ERGs, giving them sponsorship at the executive level is critical. Um, Some companies have ERGs as sort of like whoever wants to do it can lead it. There's not a sponsor. There's not a goal. There's not a you know, a line in the sand to support them. I think it's important for organizations to robustly support their ERGs, particularly to foster wellness and healthy conversations that can help improve the workplace. Yeah, for Those sure. I mean, ideas. the the idea of kind of starting this ERG with boundless and limitless and also kind of non-existent boundaries and, and resources and all these kinds of things, it very much reminds me of like every club I started when I was like seven, where <laughs> like you have no goal. You mostly just want to feel a part of something, 
but there's nothing there. And so it becomes either an echo chamber or something that everyone, you know, kind of abandons, including the founder uh, after about a week. It's real. That's real. Yeah, it It is. And so that's the thing, like you do have to think about that and you do have to think about it in terms of not only you know, what kind of structure and support you can give, but what kind of resources are you providing? You know, are you expecting people to do this, do the work and run this whole thing in addition to what they're already doing? Is this seen as, you know, a a bonus on, you know, on their, you know, kind of their, their sheet uh, or their, their permanent record. If you want to go back to like, you know, kind of childhood terms, you know, is this seen like that? Or is it seen as something that is a potential distractor? Is it seen as something that it should be, or has to compete against work, you know? Um, definitely important things to think about. Now we have less than 10 minutes remaining in today's session. It always goes too quickly, but if you have questions um, for NECPEN, please, please feel free to submit them in the chat. I'll be uh, keeping my eye peeled there in case y'all have anything you'd like to ask her. Um, All right. So we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of those meaningful gestures of, you know, uh, of like starting ERGs and supporting them. Can you give us some more examples of these meaningful gestures as well as meaningless gestures? Yes. Um, I think another meaningful gesture that I really uh, enjoy is just taking a pause from the day-to-day grind of your company to create wellness days. This is something that we've implemented at Gusto. Um, formerly I was at Deloitte. We, we have wellness days there too, where folks are just allowed to take a day off. It doesn't count against their PTO. It doesn't uh, count against their performance record, right? It is an intentional day for folks to unplug, unwind, or have more flexibility in their day than typically required. And these are great wellness days because even as a kid, I don't know if you remember for me, when I went to my mom and I was like concerned about a test or an exam, and I said, I just need a day home from school. It wasn't often, right? I was a good kid growing up, but there would be days where I like had my AP bio test coming up and I was just super anxious and I couldn't go to school. I said, mom, I need a day off, right? I just need to unwind or I need to just not have so much structure so that I can feel ready for this big thing coming up. Well, these are kind of like those days where you could take a day off and really not feel so much um, wound up around performance. Um, These are gifts that I think leaders can offer, particularly if you're pulsing your employees and you notice that folks are not feeling well, there's a lot of pressure to perform. Maybe it's a a huge hallmark timeline around your company and team. Give a wellness day as a meaningful gesture for folks to still get compensated, obviously, but still feel like they're part of a human machine and not just a machine that's asking them to sweat and give blood every day um, for the business. So that's a, a thing that I think is meaningful. A little meaningless might be more training, right? I think that a lot of people are on Zoom a ton for work nowadays. And just one more training that's just Uh, sort of an act of wellness for people um, that is a one-time deal. It's not even a continuous engagement. It's not even self-reflective or personalized. That can feel like not a meaningful gesture. And I would just caution folks, you know, it's important to train and upskill your teams. I'm always an advocate of learning development, but I think things that seem like a performative wellness that feels more like work than it is actual rest or actual investment can come across as disingenuous. And I would avoid those. Yeah, I completely agree. Like when you're talking about, you know, kind of getting into, you know, more trainings, that's not how you give people a break. You know, you're just making them completely shift gears from, okay, I was focused on work. This is coming in the middle of work. I am asked to do something, you know, mental or physical or, you know, kind of that heavy lifting during that day. And I also have all of my work stuff playing in the back of my head of like, yes, of like, I could be doing this with this time. I could be that. And you're right, like kind of having that actual clear day. You know, I, I work for a global company and we are, we've always been remote and distributed. So it kind of feels like everyone's working all of the time. So when we have a whole day off, like we, Juneteenth is celebrated with Power to Fly as a holiday. We nice. do not work the entire company. And that's hard because, you know, around the world, we're always kind of working. Yeah. So it's definitely one of those things that is incredibly impactful. And until you experience it, Oh, it is close to that, like canceling plans level of like rush (laughs) where you're like, wait, what? I don't have to do anything. Yeah. I can take a breath. I can, I can get my stuff. I can go do whatever I want to do. Right. Like that feels great too. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. So when we talk about, you know, kind of these ways that companies can invest in these strategies, 
Why do you think that it, that wellness is a cost effective strategy in the long term? Oh my gosh, this is a great question. This is why I love supporting um, you know middle managers, senior leaders around wellness strategy. Um, one of the biggest things that research shows is that people who are more well at work provide greater value to their company than those who are not well. Let's talk about some of the factors of an unwell workforce. One, folks are more sick, right? They're more likely to feel uh, unhealthy and unprepared for their role. They're more likely to call off from work, right? So you have loss of productivity in terms of time. You have people calling off um, and not being able to give their best to their work. So there's a lot of downsides to not thinking about wellness. But when you have folks who are more well, not only are you getting more productive, um, you know, value add from individuals, you're also going to motivate them to stay at the company longer. Retention is one of the biggest boosts when people implement wellness strategies, retention in a role or retention to find other roles within the same company instead of thinking of leaving. I don't know about you, but I've always had in the back of my mind as a manager that people don't quit companies or brands, they quit managers and they quit poor cultures that don't center on wellness. And I think now more than ever, it's important to double down on investing on your people because there's a talent war out there as we've all read about, right? There's a great resignation where people feel like work is not sustainable. And so wellness has to become front and center as an employment and chief people strategy so that outcomes are met and businesses can continue to grow and thrive. And we have to recenter on human beings and we have to recenter on wellness for people at work. Yes, 100%. I mean, I feel like this happens every time I host a chat, but like, I can't agree with you strongly enough. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's really is one of those things that's so incredibly crucial. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for this mm-hmm. right now. We have two minutes left. I want to make sure we're conscious of time. Um, now I know that women work is hosting their wellness focused conference. It's called well women work, um, in just a few days. Can you share with our audience where they can find out more, where they can register all that good stuff? Sure. Thanks for the opportunity to share more. So our eighth annual women work conference is actually rescheduled for April 8th. Um, and that's a Friday evening and we're having a hybrid conference centered on wellness for women of color. Our panelists and speakers are all DEI experts who are going to be sharing practical tips to empower women for advocating for themselves and also for advocating for collective culture. So if you are the company or organization that you want practical tips on how best to communicate and advocate your needs, come to this conference. We're also going to do a, a bit of an unconference in the middle of it all, where we're having a wine masterclass, a DJ and trivia night to sort of help people unwind as we close out the event. So come and enjoy yourself, take off your work hat, learn a little bit with us, but also unwind with us on April 8th. You can find out more at womenwork.com under events, click on our 2022 conference. 